kind of the gateway drug for us into Prince for, for, for Deb and I 35 years ago, believe it or not, was, was Eskimo, was Inuit Prince. I had a friend who owned the Inuit gallery in town, and uh, we started you know, buying the stone lithographs that uh, were being produced up in Hudson Bay area. Um, and sometime after, we ended up selling all of those, which I think is a, a good lesson in print collecting, which is your tastes change, you know, over time. And, that, and that's okay, you know. You develop, you, other things interest you. But I think the three areas that have always been a constant for us have been, um, at, least, at least for me, somewhat for Deb, you know, it has been, you know, Netherlandish and, and German old master prints, you know, Japanese prints of a, of a certain era, um, and for the last <coughs> few years or so, con contemporary prints. Um, and, you know, you know, I think the, the learning, as John said, is, you know, part of the great fun is, is the search for information, is the reading about the, the history of where these artists came from and what they were influenced by, and the con you know, the, for me, the historical context, you know, of where that of where that that came from, um, and so, you know, I might buy one print of a certain genre, but I might have six books, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, explaining, you know, that. And I do that for other things too, because you know, our interest, while we seem to always come back to prints, you know, we might spend several years sort of researching Central Asian textiles. You know, or Tibetan rugs, or some other thing, but it seems like we always come back to prints. And I think there's something about just the process. I mean, something so wonderful about people, you know, scratching on copper, you know, or or lithographic stones and putting it through a press and coming up with incredible images or carving woodblocks or whatever it is that just is, is so, um, you know, attractive. I think sometimes print collectors of prints you know, in, in the art world, you know, get sort of uh, short shrift in the sense of, well, it's like, it's sort of your entry level thing, you know, it's like until you can buy paintings, you know, or sculpture, you know, and crap like that, you know, but, but, um, <laughs> but the reality, is, not, not that that's crappy, but it's, it's, it's explanations that are crappy like that. Did you get that? Um, I got everybody laughing. And the reality is, is that, that prints is a medium. Is, is such a wonderful thing. You know, it's not like, gee, I'm going to buy this print by this artist, but if I could afford their oil, that's what I really would want, so I'm, I'm going to settle for their print. You know, that's, that's never the case. It's always that it's an incredible work of art, and these artists are working in those mediums. And, you know, you know recently I was reading, you know, why did, why did Dura like, you know, his, his wood blocks and his etchings even more than the painting. Well, the reason was was that he felt the freest when he was doing that. When he was painting, he was always painting on a commission for some noble person who was dictating the content and what that had to look like. But when he was doing his prints, he felt totally free to be able to be the artist that, that, that he wanted to be. You know, if you look contemporary, why did Johns and Rauschenberg, you know, start making prints? Well, they started making prints because they couldn't do what they wanted to do another way. Um, so there's just something about printmaking that's so, that's so, you know, like, you know, wonderful. Um, and, and I think that as some of the others mentioned, you know, knowing reputable and educated dealers, print dealers is, is a wonderful thing, you know, curators, you know, it's, it's an invaluable experience. Um, you know, trusting your own judgment, knowing that your, your judgment is going to change over time. Um, I, I make an effort to struggle to understand art that I don't like at all, um, and I wouldn't want on my walls at all, because um, I find that that's very kind of helpful in figuring out what it is I, I, I do like. Um, or coming back, things that initially attract me, you know, waiting and coming back to them and thinking, you know, that's, that initial attraction somehow isn't, isn't, isn't there anymore. Um, and, you know, something I read in a, by a, a, a contemporary collector who said, when I ever have to choose between two works of art that I like, I've always found that I, in the long run I'd be better off if I bought the most difficult piece. The one that I struggle the most with, um, and I think that for me that, that that's sort of good advice. You know, in the sense that in the long run, um, that struggle with that piece um, is a lot more gratifying than the piece that's just you know nice. Um, 
And so, I don't know, that's good one. Was that, was that like two pearls of wisdom? Or? <laughs> 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 I'll give you two. Well, okay. um, thank you. But, um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, I'm just blown away. I'm blown away. And we've only really just getting warmed up here. I'm going to order a carryout, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we're going to do now is we've got about five categories. Education, general print knowledge, buying, dealers, and collecting. And we're going to start with education first. Um, to, to John's point about um, don't feel intimidated, this is what we very often hear in the print society when people that come in, oh, I just don't know anything, and there's this awkwardness and uncomfortableness. I want to hear you guys talk about um, what's, what do you need to know to start buying prints? How do you educate yourself? <laughs> centuries of time, and all of that's available to read, and it is just an extraordinary thing. I mean, when we bought our first piece, we just started reading about things, and that led us to new artists and new discoveries, and I think that's just one of the big things. The other thing is, is that in our case, we ask questions, so over the next five years after buying that first piece, um, either at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, I spent over 2,000 hours talking to that curator. And I was just constantly concerned that I was taking all of his time because I was always there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and one day I talked to his assistant and I said, you know, I just feel terrible. I'm always here, you know, it's just like keeping me moving. She goes, you have no idea. She goes, he's been working here for like 30 years and he's never had a side <laughs> It was the best thing that ever happened. The fact that I came. And, uh, and so I ended up learning everything from We looked at all 20,000 items. <laughs> and so, books talk to people who know. Once you get into that, you're, you're in like one. So reading, having a key curator or somebody who's a master. Somebody right, a collector, so it's people right here yeah. can, can start people yeah. off. And, and, and look, as you mentioned, like if you can get to the International Fine Print Fair in New York every year, mm -hmm. I mean, there you have in the armory, you've got... Which just took place. Yeah, which just took place. Uh -huh. It's usually in the last week of October, the first week of, of, of November. Oh, excuse me, it's APAD that the, I was thinking. This is the IP. Yeah, IP. Oh, right. Right. IPDA, sorry. Yeah. APAD is the place. Yeah. That's the photography. And so what you get there are 80 or 90 of the world's, you know, finest dealers, right. all of whom are vetted because they're members of, of the IFPTA or whatever. IPDA. IPDA. And, um, and all their works are vetted. And there you can spend your days looking at a variety of prints that you just could never get to, you know, otherwise. Of, of you know old master contemporary 20th century 90s I mean you know the whole gamut and that that looking that constant looking um, but what am I looking for I don't know anything what am I looking for well what do you what do you want to buy what, 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 what do you want like? yeah. <laughs> what do you like? how do I know that how do I come how do you know that? what you like I can't help you there <laughs> <laughs> but I can tell if you look at something and you like it then there's an incentive for you to learn so where do I go look at I would suggest <laughs> that you take a print course. I've got several <laughs> that, uh, I, And this was in continuing education. You don't have to go get a grade. I would also suggest that you take advantage of what the Nelson has, what the Art Institute has as far as uh, uh, Art history courses that gives you some idea, and even though you might in your art history course study more about painting, but print follows painting. Uh, and another thing too that we haven't mentioned is a lot of painters do not make their own prints. They go to a, a printmaking store, for example, Crown Print Press in San Francisco or. or oh, sure. Pardon me? A publisher. Yeah, exactly. And they print the prints. The, per <clears throat> the artist will make a design. The printmaker figures out how to make that print look uh, like their paintings. And 
So anyway, that's just go visit those places. They love to have you come because you just might buy something there. Yeah. <laughs> I think for, I think for me, I I stumbled across a, a dealer. Um, you know, your experience of being a hard sell and put in, put in a room with a with a white light and saying yeah. you're going to buy this. Um, my experience, I was lucky. I found a dealer um, that was looking at investing in a collector over the long term, so wasn't interested in making an immediate sale. We spent the time, energy, and effort to provide education and explain the differences between certain printmaking techniques, um, discussing various artists, and, and it helped me learn over a period of time. And so I think if you're looking at a dealer, you certainly don't want to go to a dealer that, that, that they basically have a contract in front of them and it's sign now. Um, find a dealer who's interested in looking at a long-term relationship and willing to help you grow um, both in your knowledge and your collection, and that, that was really helpful for me. And most of the great the great dealers are that, just that. We actually had a dealer in New York in that first show. Uh, we just purchased a few things, we just got started, and it was an Albert Dewar woodcut. And uh, the good the dealer was a guy by the name of James Goodfriend, he's still in New York, he's just a marvelous young guy. He was a marvelous guy. Uh, and he's been to our house several times, just a, just a great guy. But uh, anyway, we looked at this, so we, this outdoor door, and it was, uh, you know, it was one of the, from the small passion, um, and it was Christ being crucified. It was uh, done about 15, 20 or so, and it was uh, maybe a thousand dollars. And we're looking at it, and we said, you know, tell us about this outdoor door, and he told us all about it, and we said, is this the one for us? And he looked at me really funny. He looked at the piece again. He looked at us, and he looked at Jeffrey, the guy who was taking us around. And then he put it back in the bin. And he goes, no, this one is not for you. He goes, there's a much better outdoor door for you out there. He goes, this one is for somebody who just wants to collect the name. Uh, and so they, they, it, it was three, four years later before we eventually bought something. But it was exactly that experience of somebody really caring about the long-term collector rather than, hey, I can make this thousand bucks. Yeah. Most yeah. of the dealers, I think, started with, like, as collectors, but started with an interest that, that grew to the point where in order to feed their collecting <laughs> habit, they had to be accession some, some works and sort of fell into being dealers, whatever, whatever kind, of, right. kind of objects these are. Um, but the but the beginning, it's I don't think anyone, well, uh, very few people I think say, I'd like to collect something <laughs> it's like that. It, it's it's we we're, we're most of us are wired up to collect stuff. That's if you look at your house, you've got you have the sets of dishes and silverware and stuff on counters and your kids' art and we we're I mean I think it's a. It's part of the way human beings are made is to, is, you know, hunter-gatherers that gather <laughs> uh, so we're So we're predisposed to, <coughs> to collecting stuff. And then I think it's your, it's the collecting starts because of your desire to, to uh, have something. You want, you like it, you want it. Then, then we're talking about, well, but I'm not sure. Do I really want that? I mean, I agree what says Dura is a great guy to own, but is that the one? And you had a, you know, the ultimate salesman who said, no, you don't want that, Dura. And then waited five years for you. But uh, I think we're driven by by what we like and what we're interested in. And then we become, you know, if it's, it might not stick. You might buy one and then you buy something else. And you're, like, like Paul said, your tastes change. Or, you might start learning and get deeper and deeper and more specific and learn more and more and you you know, it becomes a passion. So the, the question that occurs to me as you talk, Mike, is when, is there like a crossing point of where you stop becoming a person who's just buying prints and that you now become a collector? No, I think when you buy a print and maybe when you buy the second one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think for, for me, um, when I first started, I had an artist tell me, you know, when you start getting into art, um, you have to realize that subject matter isn't important. And that made my head spin around multiple times. Um, and then for me, when I finally understood what that meant, then I felt like I was a, a collector. Because I can now look at a piece and appreciate the work that went into it and the, uh, what the artist was trying to get across. It may not be something I hang on my wall, 
but for me, that's why I really felt like I was a collector and I had some ideas like, oh, now I know what they mean by subject matter isn't important. <laughs> what, what do they mean by that? Well, they I mean, uh, if you can look at a piece and understand, um, you can look at two different pieces and be able to understand this is a technically superior piece, this person is probably a better skilled printmaker than this particular person. And I think that's what they, that's what they meant by that. So is there a particular type of printmaking that you find that you're collecting, like etching over lithography? You know, when I first started, my first pieces were lithographs, um, and, and I, I didn't understand the amount of work that went behind a lithograph. It seemed pretty straightforward to me. So um, etchings um, will probably next, but now I'm really into wood engraving. Um, I just, you know, I have a, um, Winslow Homer uh, did some wood engravings for Harper's Weekly and various periodicals, and I, and I have one of those Harper's Weekly pages. It's just fascinating. It's interesting from an artistic perspective. It's interesting from a historical perspective. But uh, right now it's, it's, it's wood engravings and, and etchings primarily. And then, but then I learned about how hard it is to do lithographs, and I'm like, oh my. <laughs> and then, um, then I learned how hard it is to do mesotints, and I'm like, anybody who does mesotints should be in an institution. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think it, it grows, but I'm really into, into those etchings and one grade ones right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, you know, the dealer, the, the dealer scholar, and the good friends are, I think, like the perfect right. example sure. of, uh, of that, really are invaluable in showing you, you know, why is this a better print than another print? I mean, you can go to an art fair, like the print fair in New York, and you can, there may be four dealers who have a copy of the same print. All at very different price points. And so that's really an opportunity, a place that really it's hard to do anywhere else to say, well, why why, why is the difference in price? Is this a better image? Is this one cut within the plate mark? Is this, you know, what, you know, you know what earlier is, state. is an earlier state? Right. Is it a posthumous, you know, right. printing? Because even those are someone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. That's yeah. Well, but on yeah. earlier stage, now the way that a lot of printmakers print, it isn't necessarily the earlier stage, because, well, like uh, Mike Sims from Lawrence Lithography Workshop says that, you know, you might be printing one dollar, put them like this, but then, you know, it might not get put back in that same order by the time you do the colors. So I don't think you can say early stage. Well, earlier stage you're talking about. For example, uh, an etching runs through sometimes, in the case of Rembrandt's etchings, they ran through multiple states okay. as they were reworked mm -hmm. by folks gotcha. like Wadelay, Bassan, whatever, and, uh, and those things are dramatically less valuable Second, than the third, right. fifth plate sky. Right, 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 right. Yeah. 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 as opposed to the things that were uh, done, printed by Rembrandt himself. And, and what, what you were referring to, Jane, at, which I think there's some myth about the numbering of prints. Right. Um, go ahead and yes. talk more about that. Oh, well, I'm just kind of... Because frequently we'll hear the question, if I get print number one or two, is that better than print number 50 or 47? Well, it, it works <laughs> on an etching plate because your etching plate will be less sharp. Sharp, thank you. Exactly the word. Uh, <clears throat> as it goes along. But we know that numbering is not necessarily a guarantee of the sequence of which it was printed. No, it could be no, but it should be the reverse. Honestly, right, yeah. exactly. They pile them yes. up when they went to sign it, unless yes. they signed it 50 yeah. or 50. Yeah. It depends yeah. on the buyer. For, I, uh, for example, uh, like, you know, if, a, if an artist made 50 prints and number one is available and number 27 is available, which one would I choose? I choose number one. You would absolutely Why? one of fifty. Oh, there's a prestige to that first impression. Oh, but that. I think but that's just misconceived. It <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not misconceived. It's got the number one of fifty on it. Yeah. There, there's no other difference. There's no qualitative difference between, for the most part, between one of fifty or fifty of fifty or anything in between. It's just the pencil number, which makes. After all, these are commodities. You, the reason you make 50 of it is so you can sell 50 of the thing. So they are, so they are, the price is artificially supported in a limited edition because it's a limited quantity, supposedly, that's the theory. I mean, most Japanese prints are unlimited editions, so they're, you know, they print in batches of a couple of hundred usually, uh, and 
and if those sell out, they print another couple hundred, and the blocks wear, so that, and then they're recarved, and you can buy, you know, the famous grade wave, book size uh, grade wave is still being carved and printed today, and you can buy the grade wave for 400 bucks, fresh off the block, or you can buy a crummy one that was printed 100 years ago for $200, or you can print a great one that was printed 150 years ago for $100,000. So as you're looking at these, how does a, 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 a more novice person assess? Am I looking at something that was printed last week or 100 years ago? Well, that requires you have to trust your dealer, your eye, your knowledge, and that's where a reputable dealer comes in. And I know, uh, I know of uh, several artists that will do an etching and they'll make a determination it's going to be an edition of 75 and they'll create it in 1991 and they'll pull five prints from that plate in 91 um, and then they won't do any more of that edition until 2005 but they'll still sign it as 91 because that's when the etching itself was created. And sometimes they'll set an edition of 75 and never print more than 10 or 15 of the edition. Well, yeah, signing a number is, is, you know, so I think if you're going to make an addition, as, a, as an artist, who sure. makes prints. I, I think that's, I, and, and so many people disagree with me, but I think it's almost fraudulent. You should not, if you're going to say one of 50, you should make 50 and do your investment. But so many people say one of 50, two of 50, three of 50, four of 50, five of 50, and six doesn't come along until the first five are gone. And it's, I don't like that. The uh, printing, uh, sorry, signing and numbering is, uh, uh, signing doesn't begin until about 1850, and the first guy to do it was a guy named Eugene Bleary. Uh, and then it was really picked up by this gentleman here, Seymour Hayden, who was Whistler's brother-in-law. Uh, and then Whistler then really took things up from there uh, about 1870. Nobody signed prints before that. Uh, numbering is entirely a 20th century phenomenon. It doesn't begin at all until about 1905. Uh, and so anything, if you found a Whistler from 1879 signed a number, uh, you know, you've got a problem. You know? and the dealer got a little excited and trying to enhance the value of that one. Uh, and, and in point of fact, in commerce, uh, having done this for so long, talked to so many people, I don't think there's any differential in the, uh, uh, whether it's number one or number 25. I do know that the, in the case of, of, of a dry point, um, which is if it, a non-electroplated dry point, that is really where the, uh, the, the quality differentials become extremely clear. Right point is a different medium. It's kind of like etching, but not quite. Uh, and unless it's been electroplated, um, you can only get a few good impressions off the dry point. But and those later impressions are all smudgy and nice looking that are, that may aesthetically be even more pleasing than those crystal ones. I don't, I, I, I feel that. Like, uh, uh, dry point, I just agree with that. Uh, I, I disagree. Uh, I know an early dry point from the later ones really easily. This is what makes collecting yeah. collecting, right? Well, I, think, and I think with numbering, I think, yes. I mean, I've been to galleries where they've been showing, you know, the ubiquitous, you know, sort of fraudulent dollies and chagalls and whatever, you know, that. And, but they've done an additions of, I've seen them as high as 5,000, 2,500, supposedly signed in number. And I think you have to sort of look at, um, you know, we can, you know, particularly, I don't think you can always separate out the, the, the market. You buy what you love, you know, whether you ever think you're going to be able to sell it again, um, but you can't ever totally separate out the market or be influenced by the fact that, it, that, that art has value. And, you know, when, when someone, when an artist does works in editions of, you know, 200, 300, 400, 500, I think you have to be concerned, like, are you really buying a five art print? Are you essentially buying a poster? Um, you know, because, poster. because of the numbers, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even if it's a lithograph or stuff. But if you wait long enough, 450 of them will have been destroyed. <laughs> and, <laughs> your, and your great, 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 great grandchildren will have something rare and valuable. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Steve and Jane both brought books. Um, will you tell us the books that you brought that you would recommend? Go ahead. Oh, well, mine is just what I, this book is still in print, and it's been around. I even met the uh, uh, authors of this in Venice one time. 
Uh, let's see. I think they bought it right first. But anyway, it's called the Complete Printmaker. It tells just about everything you really need to know about printmaking. Sometimes you can find it in a used bookstore. Uh, but gosh, it's just, printmaking doesn't change a whole lot, particularly when you're talking about etchings and blood cuts and stuff like that. My client has kind of come up with something. Yeah, Ross was, uh, I don't think that they've got John your... John Ross was at the studio school just a few years ago. I think he's retired now, but he's been yeah. teaching there for right. quite a long time. Well, they come to this printmaking thing, uh, uh, workshop that I go to at Venice every other year. Cool. Yeah, and, uh, but, yeah. <laughs> and the book you brought to Yeah, this is just an example of the kind of literature that's available. I just brought in one. Uh, this is what's known as a catalog raisonne. What it is, is it's a listing of every print that was done by a particular artist. And in the case of, um, pretty well established artists, um, Hayden was one, um, is that they will, uh, you know, the, the authors through time, which is generally more than one catalog raised made, by the way, um, actually record every version of every state that exists, okay? Uh, and when I say a state, I just have to briefly mention that. We have a copper plate, let's take the case of an etching, and they uh, begin the process and they print, you know, they, ah, oh, it looks really good, let's see what it looks like, they print one. Now they make changes to the plate based on what they see there. That first thing they printed was state one. There might only be one impression of that. There might be two. It could be a lot. Then they go back and change it again. And they can change it multiple times. And every time they print one, that becomes a new state, a new version of that print. And what these catalogs do then is they record all of the different states. In this particular print, we have to have a home. It's a classic. Uh, of uh, landscape dry point is what it looks like here. It's actually two versions right there. Um, it's uh, called the Sunset in Ireland. It's uh, a, a terrific dry point, but this one actually exists in 15, excuse me, 14 different versions, 14 different states, and that's all recorded here. And oftentimes, as to where what museums have those various states. And so, what this is is it's just a great compendium is to learn about the artist. And all of the great artists, there are already catalog resumes on the work. On occasionally, these resumes are actually written by famous collectors. In the case of the Good Friends, they wrote the catalog resume on Felix Bouhou, who was a, one of the great French Impressionist artists that we love. So, just an so example. In, if you go to the Nelson Library, uh, Marilyn Carbonell, the head of the library there, has put together a great bib for, for prints, printmaking, print, print collecting. So it's about a three or four page bibliography of all sorts of resources available to you in the library. I would encourage you, if you have an interest in getting that. Buying. Um, do you buy art because you love it, because it moves you, because it enhances your life, or are you thinking about the significance of the artist, investment quality, uh, the price of the, the technical sophistication of the work, or a whole list of different reasons? Like right? trying to pick up women, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> I don't 
I do all of those things except for as an investment. Um, I'm not looking at it as a long-term.